So you're looking, in fact, from one lithospheric plate across the San Andreas Fault to another. The fault where it's more obvious is described by Dr. Crowell of the University of California. This is the San Andreas Fault, this six inch wide zone right down through here. And on this side, over here on the right, we have ordinary soil. Note that the bushes up near the top of the cliff are growing in it. On this side, we have broken up white rock. Now the fault last moved in this area in 1857. So we're seeing the fault that moved recently where we brought soil against very much broken up rocks. In this zone here, we have the clay-like fault rock, like uh, we've seen before. The results of each movement on the San Andreas Fault and the neighboring faults is carefully plotted and printed on a visual readout screen. Each flash represents the occurrence of an earthquake. On the San Andreas Fault itself, the lack of quakes in the San Francisco area shows that the fault is dangerously locked there. The result of past movement is described by Dr. Crowell in the field. The outcrops we're looking at up on the hill consist of white granite. This is very ordinary granite and uh, is really quite different from the rocks we have right down next to the fault zone. Down here, for example, we have the rock gneiss. Notice that it's green and splotchy. We're uh, located now on a 50-foot thick slice of material within the major fault zone. See, here is a major shear which comes down through here. And as we move along the outcrop, the rocks get more and more sheared and broken. And right in here, they turn to a dark greenish brown color. And here's a reddy streak. This is uh, ground up rock, the uh, broken down and milled and fractured and fragmented so that it's down to the size of clay. If you were to wet it, it would be very much like clay. It is material you see of the Earth's crust, which has been so milled down in this major fault zone that the larger pieces have been completely lost. Now this fault zone itself, the fault zone proper, is several feet wide, and let's cross it now. It comes along through here, way over to a point about right here, and this is the edge of the fault zone itself. And then these rocks here are very different indeed. They consist of pieces of several rock types. They are in a fossil scree deposit, which was eroded from a piece of high ground beyond the fault several million years ago. We saw that on the other side of the fault, however, we have white granite. There is none of that material here. The source area for this material has therefore been displaced a matter of about 10 miles. We have blocks of material such as this, and this, embedded in a muddy matrix. This is the fossil scree deposit and was eroded from across the fault and dumped down at the land surface. Now over here, we can see a very distinctive rock. Notice this block is yay size and has distinctive crystals in it. It is a unique type which we can recognize in a source area displaced about 10 miles from the other side of the fault zone. The movement on the fault is to the north on the westerly block and slightly to the south on the easterly block. Prior to the 1906 earthquake, lines were surveyed across the fault and were found in the 20 or 30 years preceding the quake to have bent during the elastic phase of deformation. 
and it was in 1906 that the elastic limit of the rocks was exceeded and the quake occurred as the rock began to behave brittily. The displacement of streams by the uh, movement on the fault is quite obvious from the air. And a reconstruction with a sand model shows the displacement the stream running from the bottom of the screen to the top. Successive movements displacing uh, successive streams. The results of the fracture when the rock exceeds its elastic limit is very clearly visible from the air, for example, and very easily simulated in experiments such as this. But we have to go to more sophisticated laboratory experiments to observe the elastic phase of deformation. The behavior of rock during the elastic phase of its deformation can be measured. In this case, the dial is measuring the shortening of the rock as it's subjected to pressure. Pressure is increased and then decreased. And the length of the rock changes according to the application of the pressure. In other words, it's behaving elastically, just as a spring behaves elastically returns to its original shape when the stress is removed. But if the stress isn't removed, then the energy accumulated during the elastic phase is released. The accumulation of strain can be simulated also in this experiment, where resin is poured around a conductor which is heated slowly. And as it heats, it expands and places a uh, fiberglass mixed in. Then the behavior is different, and the two different mixtures of resin simulate different kinds of rock. Once again, the heat is turned up and the conductor expands. Instead of the energy being released all at once, the energy is released in pulses. Most rocks behave like the mixture of resin and fiberglass that you saw in the film. And remembering that the final shock or the final breakage was preceded by, um, by small pulses, this gives us clearly a way of predicting when the final breakage is going to take place those preliminary pulses we call foreshocks, and they predict or they precede a final breakage that we would call an earthquake. So by monitoring them, we can predict earthquakes. In fact, what one can also do is to study the effects of the deformation of the rock during the elastic phase of deformation. That is when the rock bends prior to it breaking. Now, clearly, there are a number of things that happen. First of all, the rock itself is physically